happy holidays. I'm Steve Clemens. I direct the American Strategy Program here at the New America Foundation. It's good to be with everyone, uh, particularly with one of our star uh, performers for many, many years uh, with the New America Foundation, Nick Thompson. Nick is a Schwartz Fellow here at, the, at New America. Um, we have a great, well, previously a fellow here from 2002 to 2003. Actually, he's sort of a fellow a lot longer uh, than that. He's had a guy with all sorts of portfolios. He was a senior editor at Wired Magazine, a senior editor at Legal Affairs, um, regular guest in the Today Show and CNN's um, American Morning. I often tell an anecdote. This will make him feel uncomfortable, but it was sort of a uh, fun thing. When New America was, was, you know, at its formative stages in its early years, um, when this was a much smaller place. Michael Lynn, my colleague here, uh, and I were, were among the very few players here. And we, n nobody knew where the New America Foundation was a closet right-wing organization or a closet you know, left-wing organization. Uh, anything with America was suspect at that point. And, and Nick, uh, who is one of America's leading lights when it comes to thinking about questions of the new economy, the wired world, how it affects public policy, this is what we wanted him to write on. And he then went in and wrote about, you know, as we do, we don't censor our people, wrote a creative but dangerous piece uh, on the subject of, of the inflation of titles and the inflation of rank and the inflation of heroism and what a hero was. And he had written a piece for the Boston Globe that some of the folks that had uh, unfortunately perished in 9-11 were doing great work but weren't necessarily heroes. The next thing I knew he was on was it Bill O'Reilly's show. And Bill O'Reilly took a sort of paternal uh, uh, interest in Nick and said, young man, you may go far in your life, but not if you keep that line up and giving, you know, he said, you know, good luck, uh, but, but continue. And then I was in Tokyo, Japan, and had a, a phone call that we were about to get picketed by hundreds of fire uh, uh, marshal folks and that the National Voluntary Fire Brigade Association of the World uh, was taking significant exception to, to, to Nick. And I, I was in the middle of the night in Japan saying, what in the world just happened? So um, I was able to share a few things about you know, my own views, which differed a bit from Nick's about my own dad's heroism, an uncle who was a fireman, and we were able to keep the picket lines from forming. Uh, but nonetheless, it did show both the question of being you know, an avant-garde thinker. And I tell people that Michael Lind you know, can go home and you know, spend a weekend, write 60,000 words, and it's uh, brilliant. And we've got people like Nick Thompson and others that come in. And often they come at uh, you know, agendas or issues that aren't politically correct and, and, and do provoke and push all sorts of buttons. Uh, and, and this is what we embrace at, at the New America Foundation and did very early. It was a real test of how, how you know, I tell everybody, you don't know the norms of an institution unless you see it really sweating and under stress. Nick caused stress uh, at that moment, and uh, we all survived it and were, mu were much better. He has now written, uh, if I may, I think one of the very best books in the business for those people who want to understand the, you know, essentially the, the, the background to a lot of national security and decision making uh, in American history. And it follows in line, two of my favorite books that were done along these lines were Deadly Gambits by Strobe Talbot, which showed the rivalry between Richard Burt and Richard Pearl uh, in the first part of the Reagan administration about how to deal with the Soviets and arms control, and this pairing and dueling of two key personalities that defined you know, a lot of the edges for people. It's a very easy on-ramp for people to sort of think through the broad uh, tectonics of that time. Another that I was particularly close to was a book by Fred Kaplan called Wizards of Armageddon uh, about the early days of Rand Corporation, and he told it through a very bitter rivalry uh, between Albert Wolstetter and Bernard Brody, and I happened to work at a center at UCLA at the time that had been founded by Bernard Brody and, and, and was quite aware of how Bernard and Fawn Brody, his wife, a historian, had worked so hard to keep Wolstetter from ever teaching at UCLA. And it was a nasty, mean uh, fight uh, uh, between them about the, uh, a lot of issues. But you could see, you know, for those, any of you who are purists about national security strategy and policy, how much emotion, greed, envy, uh, and all of these human emotions have more to do with national security decisions than they should. Uh, and now we have, I think, you know, perhaps a more polite rivalry, but a key one, uh, the hawk and the dove, about Paul Nitza, George Kennan, and the history of the Cold War. Two fascinating players of which uh, Nick Thompson is descended from, from one, Paul Nitza, as his grandson, 
but uh, who was able to access files and information and uh, materials and notes and diaries that no one had been able to get to, vignettes about the long telegram that no one has ever published before. Uh, I sit now, I can't, and I have, probably have to recuse myself because there are a few other jobs, on the LA Times uh, uh, Book uh, History Prize Committee with Ron Brownstein and some others. And this hadn't been on our list yet, and, and it definitely is now, though I can't uh, comment on it because of you know, my obvious friendship with you despite what you did to me early uh, in the career of New America Foundation. But without further ado, please welcome Nick Thompson. He's going to share a few thoughts and ideas, then we'll have an active discussion. Nick Thompson. Uh, what Steve didn't mention is what act actually happened on that show, which is um, I didn't know anything about Bill O'Reilly. I had gone on the show once before to talk about you know, the North Dakota campaign or something. I thought it was just a regular political show. And so I'm going on, and I'm walking from the green room on set, and they've got the image, and it's a picture of a firefighter carrying a woman out of the World Trade Center as it crumbles, to which he says, this next guest does not think this man is a hero. <laughs> please, <laughs> please welcome Nicholas Thompson from the New America Foundation. Flashes, New America, New America. I don't probably flash their phone number, too. So, Sorry, Steve, but thanks my, for not firing my, me. My email address. Yeah. <laughs> Clemens. Um, well, and thanks for, thanks for having me here. I will um, preface this by saying that at a recent talk I gave, uh, somebody had to walk out in the very beginning because, as they said to the host, I thought this was going to be Nietzsche's grandson. Um, so <laughs> if anybody has to go, I'll <laughs> turn my head. Um, I'm going to talk about, just talk about the structure of the book, read a couple of passages for about 20 minutes, and Steve and I are going to argue, and then, um, then we'll open it up. Um, the book, the origins of the book came in um, 1999, and you know, my grandfather, he's obviously, I mean, you all know who he is, is a Washington East, the hawk, uh, spends his whole life arguing that we should build up America's arsenal. If we're behind the Soviets, we need no more nuclear weapons to catch up with them. If we're ahead of them, we need to be really far ahead of them, and if we're even, we need to have even more. Uh, at the end of his life, he sort of steps away from that. The Cold War is over. He decides we don't actually need nuclear weapons. So he writes an op-ed in the New York Times saying, let's get rid of our whole arsenal. No need for it. Um, and I'm at his house maybe a week or two later. And after dinner, he says he wants to read a letter that he got this day. And he opens it up, and it's this wonderful, short, beautiful letter um, from George Kennan. And it says, you know, Dear Paul, I read your op-ed in this morning's New York Times. Isn't it nice that after 50 years, we finally find ourselves in accord on issues that meant so much to us in times gone by? Um, and it was both the grace of that letter and the sort of implied history in it that you know, struck me, and I thought, wow, you know, what, what is it about these two men? Were they, were they really friends? What, what, what were their lives like? Um, you know, I knew my grandfather's course of his career. I didn't know a ton about Kennan. Uh, five years later, my grandfather dies. Shortly thereafter, Kennan dies, and I remember reading Kennan's obituary and suddenly realizing that these lives were incredibly parallel from the beginnings of their careers and the beginnings of influence until their deaths. It's a little bit like Jefferson and Adams on a smaller scale, where two people you know, fight for their whole lives and then die almost simultaneously. Um, so that's when I began this project. Uh, the idea was to try to tell the story of the Cold War, not episodically, but through narrative and through two characters, um, and get inside the great debates of America during that period, um, not through theory, but through scenes and details and these two people's lives. So the book begins in 1945. Kennan is the you know, ranking American in the, Soviet, in the embassy in Moscow. And, celebrations in the street, the United States and the Soviet Union have been allies in World War II, and people are out there celebrating, and he's got to go out and talk to them, right? He's the ranking American, you know, our great ally. We've won the war. Um, but Kennan, he's very skeptical. He served in Moscow and during the purges, and he recognized that Stalin is not a suitable ally. Stalin will not remain an ally throughout this. And so the book begins with him sort of pitying the crowd around him. He's worried. He's a very frail man. He's worried about being hoisted up by this crowd that's celebrating this thing he doesn't even agree with. Nitsa, meanwhile, is in Germany. He's interviewing Albert Speer, and then he flies off to Hiroshima. He's one of the first Americans to survey the landscape in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and it begins this lifetime of inquiry. Um, and so for him, the beginnings, you know, the end, of the end of the World War II and the beginnings of the Cold War are about analyzing nuclear weapons. For Kennan, it's about understanding our relationship with Russia. So that's where the book begins. Um, and I'm going to read a little passage. This is something that Steve mentioned. Uh, which is the, you know, the moment where George Kennan comes to prominence. And it was one of my, I'm going to read about an episode that when I discovered it was one of the sort of favorite moments in uh, reporting this book. You, know, you talk to, you're writing a book about the Cold War, and particularly the early Cold War. There are not a whole lot of people who are still alive. And I desperately wanted to, uh, to find somebody who'd known George Kennan at the time of the Long Telegram. So I 
called and tracked and looked for people and you know, checked records. And I finally found someone who was still alive. And I went in to see her. I say, do you remember anything about the long telegram? She says, well, yes. I tried to stop it. Uh, so this is that story. Martha Mottner was working the last shift in the American Embassy Code Room in Moscow on Friday, February 22nd, 1946. It was a bare, austere place filled only with machinery. Polyfilm covered the windows, creating a low-tech defense against Soviet espionage. The clock struck five and then six. Mottner's shift was almost over. She was thinking about her date that evening with a young, handsome Swedish diplomat. The two planned to meet up and head to a dance party at his embassy. Uncertain he was the right man for her, she knew she could find another if things did not work out. Beautiful, young, smart, working in a diplomatic corps where men vastly outnumbered women, Mottner could pretty much take her pick. It was nearly seven. Mottner was ready to bolt, and the tall figure of George Kennan appeared at the code room door. A cold, sinus problems, fever, toothache had laid him up for the past several days. He had last been seen upstairs, dictating to his secretary from a couch. But now he was standing before Mottner, holding a thick stack of white papers. He had an important and urgent telegram. It had to go to America, and it had to go now. He handed the stack to Mottner and told her to type it in. She looked with frustration at the first page in its ominous opening sentence. Answer to Departments 284 involves questions so intricate, so delicate, so strange to our form of thought, and so important to our analysis of international environment that I cannot compress answer into single brief message without yielding to dangerous degree of oversimplification. For three years, Kennan had sent telegrams warning of Moscow's hostility. He'd been lambasting, haranguing, cajoling, arguing, pontificating. But each memo describing Stalinist malfeasance had slipped into the quiet river of unread documents flowing through Washington. Now Kennan's masters had asked him to let loose. He had obliged. His work combined the weight and breadth of an essay with the clipped urgency of a telegram. He wanted it sent. Montner respected and liked Kennan, but she was also a little bored by him. Besides, she had a date to get to. Sending this document would take hours. She gave it a quick scan, quickly got the gist, and handed it back. Does it really have to go out tonight? You said all this before. But Kennan insisted, maybe the message was not new, but this version was important. Most likely, no one would read it. Most likely, anyone who did would not care. But Kennan had poured into it his anger, his wisdom, and his knowledge of history. He'd be damned if this chipper young woman with her Swedish paramour would come between his 5,300 words in Washington. They've asked for it, he said, and now they're going to get it. Um, so that's, that's the beginning. That's where George Kennan becomes an important voice in American foreign policy. That's the long telegram, comes to Washington, James Forrestal reads it, hands it to everybody, and it plays a very important role at a very important moment in changing the way America perceives Russia. As Kennan correctly perceives, uh, perceives it at the time, if it had come six months earlier, it would have been completely ignored. If it had come six months later, it would have been conventional wisdom. But in February 1946, it was the, exactly the right time to send this memo, uh, and it helps to turn. It helps to turn America from realizing that Stalin is an ally with whom we have to deal and offer this and offer that to realize that Stalin is basically an ineluctable adversary and will we'll be that way. Uh, Kennan, after this, is summoned back. He's quickly made head of the policy planning staff. Uh, he's asked, you know, who do you want to have on your staff? And he says, well, there's a, a young economist who seems to be doing quite well in the State Department, a guy named Paul Nitza. Can I, can I bring him on board? To which Dean Atterson says, uh, no, you can't. Uh, he's not a big thinker. He's just a Wall Street operator. So that request is denied. Uh, Nitsa doesn't come on board. Um, and gradually, Kennan's influence grows. But two years, two years later, he does bring on Nitsa. And that's really, that's really Nitsa's beginning at uh, a, a moment of power. He's the deputy to Kennan on the policy planning staff. And so there's a very brief window, you know, in 1948 and then in 1949, where Kennan and Nitsa are working together. And they work simultaneously on the Marshall Plan, they have ideas on what, how to change U.S. policy towards Germany. They're very close. They seem to agree. They're sitting side by side in this organization of eight, you know, coming up with grand strategy for, um, you know, for Marshall, for Truman, later for Atchison. Um, you know, containment, as initially conceptualized, is partly worked out by Paul Nitz and George Kennan working together. Then, 60 years ago this fall, um, the Soviet Union sets off an atomic bomb. And this is where everything changes and diverts. Soviet sets it off, Atchison says, we need to figure out how to respond. Are we going to build a hydrogen bomb in response to the Soviet atomic bomb, or are we not? Uh, you know, George, Paul, tell me what I should think. So Kennan disappears. He goes into you know, his office. He sits and he thinks. And for him, this is the moment where America is about to go off the rails. We're about to enter this horrible arms race. My God, you know, if we build this, then they will build this, and we will build this, and they will build that, and there will be no way to stop. Uh, we cannot do it. He quotes Shakespeare. He quotes the Bible. He's you know, full of St. Paul. It's this wonderful essay. Nitsa has a much simpler um, you know, metric, which is, well, if we don't build it, and they do build it, will we be in a bad position? Why, yes. Are they trying to build it? 
They are. Therefore, we must build it. And he, instead of trying to write a long document, starts arguing. And he joins committees. He joins meetings. He excludes people he think will disagree with him. He becomes a classic bureaucratic insider, and he's quite good at it. And he plays a role in influencing Atchison. Atchison plays a very important role in influencing Truman. And we go ahead with it. Cannon, meanwhile, as the debate is almost over, he hasn't said a word. He emerges with this 79-page document, which is beautiful. It's wonderf wonderfully written. It's very smart, very perceptive. But it's completely and totally useless, because who's going to read a 79-page document when you need to make a decision by Tuesday? Um, so it's a moment, it's a very important moment for my book. Well, it's a very important moment, obviously, in American Cold War history. It's a very important moment in the narrative of this book and the arc of this story, because Nitsa and Kennan, from that moment on, set the paths they'll live for the rest of their lives. Nitsa is the diligent bureaucratic insider. Kennan is the elegant outsider who you know, is waving his hand but isn't able to have any influence, largely because he doesn't know how to work the system, but is writing and thinking beautifully and quite perceptively. So that's, from then on, they begin their trajectories. You know, Kennan, he serves briefly in government. He becomes ambassador um, to the Soviet Union, becomes ambassador to Yugoslavia. But really, he's a dissenter and he's a dissident. Nitsa becomes the insider. He works for every administration from Roosevelt to Bush. He ends up being deputy secretary of defense under Johnson. He's Reagan's chief arms negotiator. He's a big part of the SALT delegation. He's always, always on the inside. He never makes it to the top, in part because he always gets fired. Um, he, used to, he used to brag, I remember as a grandson, him bragging that he would have been fired more times by anybody than anybody else in the history of American diplomacy. May or may not be true, but he was fired or demoted by Roosevelt, Eisenhower, Kennedy, basically Johnson, Nixon, Ford, Carter, and Bush. So eight out of ten uh, at a different point was, was sacked. Um, but meanwhile, you know, every time he's fired, he gets back up, gets back in. Well, for, when he's fired, the first thing he does is he tries to viciously undermine whoever just fired him. And then, after a brief period, he you know, works with some sort of dissident organization to disrupt them and then eventually is pulled back in. Um, and that's the entire pattern for, for his career. Uh, I'm going to read one. This second passage is a very is a short one, which I think is, is, uh, is telling and interesting. One of the... Uh, uh, you know, Kennan is often thought of as this great dove. Uh, I know there's some people in this room who have countered that, um, countered that notion and have noticed some of the harsh things that Kennan has said in his writings. I, I see Derek Liebart, his book, 50 Year Wound, has some wonderful details about, uh, about George Kennan. I'm going to read a little passage. Um, I got access to all of Kennan's diaries as I worked on this book. Um, so I had all these wonderful papers from my grandfather, of course, and then a huge stash that... Uh, you know, a janitor at SICE showed to me that nobody else knew about, you know, 60 boxes from my grandfather's life. Um, but then also because I'm Nitz's grandson, um, Kennan's family was quite open and they gave me all of his diaries. So this is a little passage from the summer of 1957. Uh, he's preparing a series of lectures on the BBC and he's thinking, you know, what should I talk about? What do, I, what do I need to tell them? And this is what he's writing. To be fully honest, I should give the lectures on why there is no hope in the international situation. He then began to muse about his ideal agenda, merging the United States with Canada and Britain, eliminating Washington, good riddance indeed, creating a new capital near Windsor or Ottawa, and then splitting the new nation into four regions. This would be followed by population reduction, the banning of cars, and a little bit of autarky. Quote, the truth is that democracy in the Western world could be saved from itself only by 50 years of benevolent dictatorship, which would, like a doctor, restore the patient to a reasonable state of origin and then put him on his own again. So that's... That's the dove. Um, and Kennan's diaries are just marvelous. I mean, he's this deeply cranky, moody, pessimistic, dark figure who, meanwhile, is beloved by everybody on the left as, you know, the great dissenter, the man speaking reason about nuclear war, the man that the environmentalists and the peaceniks, you know, we all love. And he goes home and, <laughs> well, he has some one other wonderful choice passages, some of which, uh, some of which you can find in the book. Um, okay, so that's the early 1950s. Kennan goes to Yugoslavia, and he's sort of he's forced out. He has one moment of incredible prominence during, the, prominence during the Vietnam War. He gives testimony in 1966, foreseeing a lot of what will happen in the war, explaining things that will become common knowledge later, for example, making the argument that the North Vietnamese are nationalists more than they are communists. Um, they've been fighting the Chinese for centuries. It's not as though they're part of an international communist conspiracy. They're just using it to gain leverage in this conflict, gives this testimony. It's you know, beloved by people. He gets all these wonderful letters from women who say, I saw you on TV and I was ironing my shirts and I burned right through them because I couldn't stop watching you. Um, and it's, you know, it's an interesting and important moment in the Vietnam War. It's this elegant, wise man in a vest. You know, it's not a radical with long hair and a beard protesting the war. It's George Kennan who's been thrown out of Moscow by Stalin. Uh, 
Um, but mostly he's, he's in the background. He's writing these wonderful books, these incredible memoirs. He's winning Pulitzer Prizes left and right. Nitsa goes in, he works for Kennedy, he's there, XCOM and the Cuban Missile Crisis, he's there during the Berlin Crisis. There are all sorts of great episodes we can talk about. He was then kicked to the Navy, comes back under Johnson, he you know, works actually against the American buildup under Westmoreland, and then we get to the 1970s. So now I'm going to read a, another short passage about that. The 1970s were the decade when everyone in Washington learned the fateful acronyms. Our silos were stocked with ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles. They're armed with MIRVs, multiple independently targetable reentry vehicles. If the Soviets attacked, our best bet would be counter with SLBMs, submarine launched ballistic missiles. Or maybe one day we could stop them with an anti ballistic missile, ABM, system. Nitz had helped coin the new vocabulary, and now he would master it. He studied the weapons the way a monk studies scripture. Every word and every weapon had meaning. World peace hinged on a stable relationship between the U.S. and Soviet arsenals. That stability could hinge on apparently tiny details. If Moscow were allowed to build just a few more of these, with those components, and we did not counter with this, the Soviets might be tempted to start a war. He had begun his reflection on the balance of atomic weaponry in Hiroshima with the Strategic Bombing Survey, had continued since. Both at the beginning and at the end of the decade, he knew more about nuclear weapons than almost any other man alive. Nitz's fascinated immersion was matched by Kennan's willfully uncomprehending alienation. To him, the acronyms and the details were preposterous. What could one or twenty or a hundred more of these horrors possibly mean if we already had enough to turn the planet into Venus? In one sense, the stockpiles were all too real. In another sense, they were imaginary. For by tinkering with numbers and fretting over ratios, we created an illusion of control. The truth was that we had built something far too powerful for us to manage. Kennan did not reach back to Hiroshima. He reached back to his trip to Hamburg after World War II when he concluded that no rational man could any longer countenance war on a grand scale, even with non-nuclear weapons. The two men reached these opposed conclusions through temperament and experience. Nitze had spent his youth building home telephone sets. Cannon had quietly written poetry. Nitze came to trust and believe in the power of numbers, whether in the form of Clarence Dillon's financial charts or Albert Speer's list of ball-bearing factories. Cannon believed that technology destroyed more than it created. Nitze spent his life gaining confidence. He was unusually popular, generally the smartest man in the room, and always well off. From the death of his mother soon after birth, Kennan spent his life learning doubt, self-doubt, as well as doubt in the wisdom of the men making decisions for the world. Nitz's career had led him to believe that the U.S. government, especially when he was involved, could make sound decisions. Kennan felt that the U.S. government was all too likely to go astray. Nitz believed he could answer the new epic questions. Kennan believed that nobody could, and that the ghastly weapons were now in the saddle and riding mankind. The two men had agreed on a great deal in the previous 20 years. Korea, Eisenhower, Vietnam. But by the 1970s, when nuclear weapons haunted every element of American foreign policy, Nitsa and Kennan seemed to agree on nothing. Now they truly became the hawk and the dove. So that sets the stage for the 1970s. Nitsa is extremely prominent, you know, working on the SALT negotiations, SALT I negotiations, and then viciously trying to undermine the SALT II negotiations, including through some nefarious CIA maneuverings that we can um, uh, talk about. Kennan is dissents against them. The Reagan administration comes. Nitsa is brought in very sensibly by Reagan. You recognize that Nitsa, when he's outside, will be a fierce critic. When he's inside, will actually solve problems. Richard Pearl, when, uh, when my grandfather is brought in, says, oh, he's an inveterate problem solver, um, which is one of my favorite quotes about, uh, about my grandfather. Nitsa come in, comes in. He's the lead negotiator of the INF treaties. He famously walks in the woods to try to um, get an arms deal when he feels like the bureaucracy is against it. He's one of the lead advocates of signing the grand bargain at Reykjavik. Uh, you know, the two men's you know, views sort of converge here at the end of the Cold War. Uh, and then the Cold War ends. Um, Kennan, you know, maintains his position of prominence when the, when the Berlin Wall comes down. Kennan is feted in Congress. He's a, you know, given all sorts of presidential medals of freedom. Um, and to him, it's great that it happened, but if they had just followed his advice earlier and hadn't militarized the conflict, it would have happened a lot earlier. Uh, my grandfather is, you know, quite pleased it ended the way it did, and is willing to take some credit. At the, uh, in 1990, my grandfather uh, is 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 asked. He's on uh, the News Hour, and he said, "So, so why did we win the win the Cold War?" And he says, "Well, George Kennan had the right ideas, and I made them operational." And then, uh, <laughs> shortly thereafter, another journalist says to him, uh, uh, or no, he's he's asked about Kennan by another journalist, and he says, "Well, you know." Kennan always felt like I hijacked his policy and turned American policy or worked away from what he wanted. He was right. <laughs> um, so I'm going to read one last passage, and then I'll get into the, uh, to the Q&A with Steve. This is, um, this is the end of the book, uh, and it's the, sort of the one moment where I talk about my personal connection to my grandfather. I tried, you know, when you write a book about your grandfather, the first obvious criticism is going to be 
you're just inflating the guy. I mean, it's a, he doesn't deserve the historical significance, and in fact, you're, you're going too easy on him. So, and you also can't be overly critical because then it looks like you've, because of whatever personal issues you have, have been overly critical on the family member. So you're one of the most, you know, slightly different, one of the most interesting and important conversations I had was with my editor right when I started this book. And I said, well, you know, it's easy to write about Kennan in here, but Gramps, and he said, stop. I don't want you to refer to him as Gramps again until this book is out. I want you to refer to him as Nitza. Uh, and so I tried very hard to be extremely as detached as I could be and to write about him uh, as a historian, as a fair, as, you know, a historian who have, had extraordinary access to documents and the people would do. And so that was a challenge. The only time I break from that is at, is at the end. In late September 2001, I visited my grandfather's home in Georgetown. As he often did, he sat in his study, leaning back deeply in an oversized easy chair. Cane rested by his side. Books were stacked on a table next to a small silver bowl of nuts and a glass of red wine. He moved slowly, had grown a light, scratchy beard. He talked infrequently and with great effort. I would often come just to sit near him and keep him company. Sometimes I would read to him. This day, he started by saying how shaken he had been by the terrorist attacks on the Pentagon and the World Trade Center. I nodded, told him I agreed. After waiting for a bit, I decided to ask a question. Looking over his bookshelf, I noticed the complete works of Conrad, each conspicuously worn. How, Gramps? Did you have time to read all those books when you were negotiating all the arms treaties? Missiles are boring, he replied deliberately. Conrad is interesting. He then began to reflect a little bit over his life. Again, he paused. Sometimes I think I've had so much more luck than I deserve. That evening, I wrote down another nugget of wisdom he passed on that day. I keep going because I still find it interesting. Three years later, in the summer of 2004, we had our last conversation. I came by to tell him of my engagement and plans for a wedding that I knew he'd be far too frail to attend. Is she kind, he asked. Yes, I replied. He came back with the last sentence he ever said to me. Tell me about her. On October 19, 2004, he let go his grip on life. Kennan gave one final public interview in 2002, when he was 98, warning that the United States should not rush into Iraq. War has a momentum of its own and carries you away from all thoughtful intentions when you get into it. Today, if we went into Iraq, like the president would like us to do, you know where you begin. You never know where you're going to end. His body was frail, and he knew it was time to tie up his most important loose end. One day he put on his coat and tie and told his nurse, Betsy Barrett, that he wanted to pray for his mother, whom he said had died knowing that she would never know her son. He went to his church, spent 15 minutes on his knees. He never mentioned her again. Ken was determined to be alert for his 100th birthday. As the day neared, he tried to stay sharp by folding little pieces of paper, trying to keep track of them. But he knew he was losing control of his mind, just as his wife of more than 70 years had. Annalise was a sound body, that she could no longer remember what she had done during the day. One of the last things Barrett remembers is Kennan tenderly looking at Annalise, who he knew could no longer understand him. He wished, he said, we could go down the steps and out through the door together. He died at age 101 on March 17, 2005, 149 days after the death of his lifelong rival and friend. That's the book. Thank you, Thanks. Nick. You know, one of the things we want to talk to is I wanted to drag this... Uh, uh, fascinating portrayal of these two key players in American grand strategy into the present and, and raise some questions. And one of the things that I was in Berlin a week and a half ago, and I read the section about the Berlin airlift in which both mm -hmm. Kennan and Nitza played key roles. Yeah. But one of the things that struck me when you come in to sort of bring in a, in a contemporary sense is how quickly they, being chief apparatchiks in their various ways were, of the American national security enterprise, uh, we had, we had so, sort of won World War II. We were the largest uh, economy in the world, uh, I think six times larger than the next uh, uh, player. And yet when it came to confronting in a conventional way the Russians mm -hmm. over Berlin, they both, they both of them backed off that and said that they, they, there was a very quick recognition, and I don't know why they had such a recognition, mm -hmm. that we couldn't, we couldn't bear those costs. Yeah. And when you look at some of the other players, Curtis LeMay, John Foster Dulles, and others who so casually talked about the kind of conflicts in war, Nitza and, and Kennan both didn't do that. And so, one, I'd love to hear any thoughts about that. But then when you come in today, I sort of was thinking that, that, that in Washington, we've all kind of, not we all, I haven't, but many people have become casual Curtis LeMays, that war is easy, that bombing Iran, no problem. Will win. I mean, the assertion of confidence in the ability to deploy power and get predictable, deliverable results is is almost you know you know cocktail chatter conversation that's become very easy. And so I'm interested in this episode of how these guys didn't fall into the hubris mm -hmm. of triumphalism after World War II that made them 
engineer the Berlin airlift the way they did. Yeah. It's a, it's a very astute and important point. I mean, so Kennan, his life follows a very particular pattern. He was one of the founders of the School of Realism, and he consistently argues, as he does in that last interview about Iraq, whether it's the Berlin airlift, whether it's Korea, whether it's Vietnam, whether it's almost anything, that the United States will not succeed in what it's, it will not be able to fulfill its international ambitions. We may think we're going to be able to change the world in this way, and we will not be able to do so. The pattern of our history is that we have these wonderful ambitions, we get into these things, and we mess it up. And I can almost be certain that if he were here, he would talk about Afghanistan in similar terms. You know, there are certain things we need to do. But I guarantee you that if we try to build up the Karzai government, we try to build up Afghanistan, we will fail. I mean, this is one of Kennan's central points, consistently says it. What's interesting, I mean, people know that about Kennan. What's interesting is that Nitsa, despite his confidence and desire to build up our arsenal, when it actually came to engagement, whether it's in the Berlin airlift, whether it's in the Korean conflict, whether it's in Vietnam, almost always he said, no, wait a second. Let's back off. We don't actually want to go there. You know, we need more nuclear weapons, not so that when we have a war we can win it, but so there isn't a war. I mean, he's constantly trying to not escalate with the Soviet Union, in part because he understands the dangers, because he had been to Hiroshima. You know, one interesting thing I know from being his grandson is that at the very end of his life, um, you know, he was in Hiroshima, you know, literally three or four weeks after the nuclear bomb hit. He was early September of uh, 45. At the end of his life, when it's sort of stream of consciousness about, you know, what he remembered from his life and the people, you know, and it's not connected and he, you can't answer questions, but he's talking about this all the time. It's something that he's stored up inside of himself. Uh, and I think that he held that in the back of his mind and he was extremely wary of uh, the conflicts of battle. You know, when, also in the, you know, I was sort of trying to think the other day, would there be rivals today in the modern environment? Um, who you could tell an interesting story with. You know, we commissioned a book last year with, with Brzezinski and Scowcroft, who now see more similarly than they do apart, but they were one-time rivals. Uh, you can imagine in the Bush administration telling the kind of tale you did as a, as a battle between John Bellinger, who used to be the senior attorney on the National Security Council staff, and David Addington, who was one of the chief animators of Cheney's world, or Cheney versus Bob Gates, or, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, I don't know, Michael Lind versus Paul Wolfowitz in different sort of ways of thinking about grand strategy. You can think about telling these pairings, mm -hmm. but it does raise this question of do you think that there is something about the environment today? Either are we unaware of great grand strategists that are in the game, or do they just simply not exist the way they once did? Um, I think they don't have the same longevity that they did. I mean, what's amazing about Nitz and Kennan is that they're there for 60 years, and they're at points, they're not as important as they are at other points, obviously, but they are really coming up with grand strategies and thinking through and debating these grand strategies for six decades. And I think Dennis Ross would see himself as someone. And you could say Richard who, Holbrook too, yeah, right? Or Holbrook. Right. Um, but they're not. They're not as. They're not as many. And I think part of that is because neither Nitzan nor Kennan was ever swept into a party apparatus. Um, you know, as I said earlier, my grandfather was hired and fired by number of Republicans, number of Democrats. He was always an independent, um, technically a Democrat, but really his own guy. Uh, and I think the same thing can be said of Kennan, who didn't like either party and didn't, you know, had profound disdain for both of them. And because they were never sucked into party apparatuses, they always were, you know, able to, A, think independently. They never had to, you know, follow this particular line because we need you to say this during a particular debate, or they had less pressure to do that than they would have otherwise. Uh, and then the other, the other important point is they were, you know, constantly engaged in policy battles. They never go went to go work for you know, consulting groups or people who would have, um, you know, made them say you know, for financial reasons what they uh, things that they wouldn't have wanted to say. So they're consistently independent. They're consistently in engaged, and they're never sucked into things that can both make you less interested in what you're saying and make you less interesting to other people. Before I open up, let me just finish with one other one, one last point. You know, if I were to, um, you know, grading Obama. And his administration is always slippery. There are some days I wake up and I say, yay, Nobel Prize. Other days I say, what has he done? You know, and, and, and you know, it's complicated to, to critique it. But I, I can say with some certainty that the Obama administration thus far has managed to do something I thought was fairly impossible, which was to simultaneously frustrate the, the school of realists and progressive realists that I would put myself in, <laughs> the global justice, human rights community, and the neocons, uh, <laughs> all of them together. But the one class of, of those who sort of seem to be supportive of where the administration has been going on some of its choices, what I, what, what I call the strategic class, mm -hmm. are those people who sort of see an ever-growing uh, 
kind of inertia, incrementalism of military-driven pentagonism, essentially. Mm -hmm. But it's not necessarily reformed. It's not, it's not shaped or sculpted in certain ways. That group is largely satisfied mm -hmm. with the direction and course. And it seems to be that group that Kennan was most concerned about um, empowering and creating its own. My, Eisenhower was concerned about that. Mm -hmm. And do you think your grandfather has complicity in launching that, where today the strategic class, mm -hmm. per se, maybe that's the wrong term for it, um, is dominant, and we've lost to a certain degree. I mean, uh, again, not to just pick on Mike Lind, but Mike Lind has written, I think, one of the best books out there in terms of thinking about a new grand strategy for U.S. strategy. I know other people who've done this as well, but it's trying to basically do battle with this, with, with, with a kind of inertia-driven, highly resourced capacity mm -hmm. has changed the dynamic. It's why doing a solarium exercise today is very, very difficult because mm -hmm. you're not arguing from the same base. But has this military industrial thing mm -hmm. uh, was was it was it in fact did Kennan end up being right and did your grandfather animate something that's going to be very hard for the U.S. to escape from? Yes, um, I mean Kennan anticipates the military industrial complex. He anticipates the dynamics that you're discussing in his 1949 essay and in many other things he he wrote. He anticipates it before many other people perceive what's happening. Uh, my grandfather, as far as I can tell neither anticipates nor particularly worries about it. Um, but it's also true that though he inspired it and though he was you know, beloved by the Boeings of the world in the late 1970s, he was extremely cautious never to take a dime from them, uh, never to... Uh, he said something once to my father. that I, I was talking to my father about this, the Committee on the Present Danger. You know, why, why didn't the Committee on the Present Danger take, take money from its nat national, natural allies? Why in the late 1970s, when they're you know, arguing for a much greater missile buildup, didn't they take money from the people who were building the missiles? Uh, and my grandfather sort of looked at him angrily and said, you know, I have nothing to market but my reputation for honesty and integrity. Um, and I think um, the point here is that, yes, the work he did, you know, particularly the Committee on the Present Danger and... You know, Which is something you can't say about the second Committee on the President Danger co-chaired by Lieberman and John Kyle and Jim Woolsey and right. you know, well, that, other companies. The, the, that's actually the third committee on the President Danger, I believe. There's also one in the 1950s. Yeah, and I think it's something that, uh, I mean, it's, it's also true that my grandfather brought in a lot of, um, you know, in 1969, my grandfather forms this organization called the Committee for a Prudent Defense Policy. And uh, it's arguing for, um, you know, why we need to build a safeguard missile defense system. And he you know, decides he needs to hire some interns. Uh, and he hires four. And they're uh, Peter Wilson, who works at RAND, Richard Pearl, Paul Wolfowitz, and Edward Lutfock. You know, all get their start in Washington as interns for Paul Nitze. Uh, you know, Jim There's a Woolsey. lot to blame your grandfather for. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jim Woolsey also, uh, <laughs> right, but this is, that's the sort of thing that would help me if I ever go on O'Reilly to talk about this book. Mm. Um, the, the far right is actually quite supportive of this book because I'm, you know, Nitze's grandson. Um, uh, he also brings Jim Woolsey into Washington. You know, Woolsey gets his first job under my grandfather. So my grandfather, you know, inspires a, a line of thought in um, American foreign policy. But of course, he also clashes with them, and I think that goes back to to his congenital independence. Hmm. Interesting. Let me open the floor to other discussion of this fascinating book. Uh, let's go right here in the middle. Is that Shelley? Yeah, Shelley. Yeah. Uh, hi, uh, Shelley Williams, president of the Osgood Center. We hope How to see are you, you yep. in January. Good. Looking forward to it. And, and we're going to be at SICE. And, and part part of what I'm asking about now is. Where um, does education play a role in creating and studying grand strategy? Mm -hmm. You look at the independent education of the two people involved. One comes out of finance, one comes out of history. Uh, the, they have this grand strategic vision. Uh, but SICE and other professional schools of international relations do or do not create that capacity? And was that, their was that your grandfather's intention to create a place where people would think strategically or just be worker bees in, in, in Washington. <laughs> oh, it's absolutely. My grandfather, it's the, my grandfather founded SICE, and he founded SICE under very, you know, I think, funny circumstances. And he finds, founds it in the early 1940s, where he's you know, a low-level civil servant who's been in Washington for a year. I mean, he's, you know, I joke in the book that he was more qualified to be a graduate student than the founder of a school. Um, but you know, in this incredible act of hubris, he says, I'm going to start this school. Uh, and he does, and it turns into SICE, and it prospers, and at the, you know, at the end of the life, it's one of the things he's absolutely most proud of creating, and in part for the ability to foster grand strategy. And 
Kennan absolutely thought so too. He thought that he wished more Americans went into the Foreign Service and went to schools like SICE. He had his own views on how these academies should work. You know, people should wear you know tight press pants and work from 6 a.m. until you know 10 p.m. and not be allowed to talk to girls. I mean, he had very you know, Kennan's a very formal guy, uh, and his ideas of how the school would work to sound awful. But you know, he certainly wanted it. Interesting. Other questions? Yes, right here, uh, Scott McConnell, and then we'll go in the back. Hi, uh, Scott McConnell, the American Conservative. Um, I think that your your grandfather may have been the most prominent member of the wise men or the old foreign policy establishment to align with the neoconservatives in the 70s and did a lot to kind of validate them and yeah. bring them into the, into the tent. I guess you, uh, when you mentioned the, his interns, I didn't know that also. But um, I, I guess my question is, is can you uh, elaborate a little bit on that relationship and what tensions and what commonalities and how it may have changed over time uh, from the of 70s through the 80s and um, yeah I mean my grandfather is it's it's a it's a complicated relationship it's not as you know, my grandfather really cared about one issue and that is what is our policy going to be towards the Soviet Union in particular what will our nuclear weapons policy be and if people agreed with him on that he was willing to agree with them on almost every other issue I mean he's very much if you take the liberal conservative debate um, you know, even during the 1980s, on many issues, he, you know, was you know very environmental. He was very concerned about global warming and acid rain. You know, even in the you know late 1980s. But these aren't the central issues to him. The central issue is what to do about the Soviets. And there, he absolutely agrees with the neoconservatives and with Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan is one of his two favorite presidents, uh, and so he's extremely close with them, even when he disagrees with them on a lot of issues. I don't know. You know, if you had gone to him and. And by the end of his life, I certainly asked him what he thought of the Iraq War and, you know, what do you think of this? And I think it's a terrible idea. But I don't, I, don't, I don't know if you could have had him at his most cogent period and if you had asked him a variation of a question that you're asking and similar to your asking, which is, how do you feel about the work that has been done by the people who came to Washington under you? How do you feel about the legacy of Wolfowitz and Pearl? And I think there probably would have been a lot that he was extremely proud of. I mean, he was quite proud of their successes and quite close, you know, certainly to, to Wolfowitz at the end of his life. So I think there was a, a lot that he agreed with them on, a lot that he liked of, and a lot of pride he felt in helping to, he loved it when people he brought to Washington or he, people he helped mentor went on uh, to succeed. Yes, right here. And then in the back. Uh, my name is Francis Shu. How much do you think that the environment that he found was easier than ours in this sense that there was one central enemy yeah. and there was one central technology, nuclear weapons, and they both happened to reside in one area, in other words, the Moscow. Yeah. And we, we are, our comp, uh, in other words, our, anyone in this era trying to develop a grand strategy, you know, they have to be, you know, have the brain power of, you know, like 10 of people like your, your grandfather to, yeah. to think of all the ramifications of all the possibilities and all the players and so on and so forth? Um, it's definitely simpler and it's definitely narrower and the stakes are much lower. And I think part of why the intensity of thought that went into these intellectual debates was the recognition that Nitsen and Kennan disagreed. And they disagree, uh, you know, profoundly. And not only do they disagree profoundly, they believe that if the other if the other's policies are followed, there is a significantly larger percentage that the world will be obliterated, right? Which is a very different debate from the ones we have today. So the debates today are, you know, broader, more complicated, and also, <laughs> in some ways, less important. Um, but to your question, I mean, the simple answer is yes. In the very back, this gentleman. Well, this gentleman and the one you had your hand up, right? Okay. We'll just go to the two. I just like. To make a state uh, parenthetically on uh, your mention of Ronald Reagan, and we he boasts boast, boast often stated, we won the Cold War. Uh, we didn't win the Cold War, neither did the Russians. The Japanese won the Cold War, uh, while the Americans and the USSR were, uh, they were boycotting and bargaining and fighting and growling. The Japanese were trading worldwide. They had a balance of payments. It was embarrassing. 
And it had a huge subliminal effect in ending the Cold War, a huge effect. So that's all I have to say. Okay. Thank you. And let's take the question here, then. Um, a lot of what you talked about in the uh, Cold War dialogue here is very overt, right? I mean, the mm -hmm. nuclear weapons thing, everybody knew that was going on. But there was also covert war going on that yeah. Kennan played a big role in establishing uh, when he came back to the States. Can you talk about, mm -hmm. or uh, was there any sort of involvement? It's something many people understand, that Kennan was a big counterintelligence guy. Uh, absolutely. You, I mean, you couldn't be a yeah. Sovietologist and not be obsessed with... Spies. Spies, <laughs> espionage, and that whole thing. He played a major role in the stand-up of our, you know, current day uh, uh, clandestine collection and covert action type infrastructure. Um, was Nitsa involved in that that dialogue, or did he have opinions on it? Um, okay, so first uh, to the previous gentleman's comment, there's, it leads to you know one of the sometimes people will come up and say you know Paul Nitsa won the Cold War, and the argument there is it's it's, it's kind of uh, you know dog eating its own tail in two ways. One, the argument is you know Reagan. One of the reasons we won the Cold War is that Reagan spent the Soviet Union into the ground. Even if you believe that and give Reagan credit for that, and it's a you know we could debate that. It's a fun question to debate. Nitsa was the one most opposing that, right? He was the one most opposing our arms buildup during the Reagan administration, the, most, the one most in favor of the grand arms deals uh, under Reagan. So even if you give credit to Reagan for that, you can't give Nitsa credit for that. It's, a very, you know, it's, it's very interesting to have the conversation about how much credit do you give Nitsa for winning the Cold War because it really depends on what explanation you give towards the end of the Cold War and then how much credit you give Nitsa for that explanation. Two, uh, covert operations. Yes, Kennan... Uh, Kennan helps to set up, the co I mean, more than anybody else, Kennan in 19, spring of 1948 helps to set up the covert operations wing of the CIA. You know, that's part of his version of political containment. I mean, he's all in favor of, you know, he's all in favor of manipulating elections. He's completely in favor of, you know, secretly seizing oil fields if you have to. He's, uh, I mean, I joke that he's a dove but also a pterodactyl. Um, so he, and he, you know, he later he regrets it, but he mostly regrets that he didn't get to, to run it and control it and, you know, all these other people took over from it. Nitz's engagement, not, um, you know, not that direct. He's friends with all his friends with the, um, you know, the Wisners, the Desi Fitzgeralds. They all go and you know, spend Fourth of July at his house. You know, the, my mother talks about the people she knew in government. You know, you Google them, and they all were covert operators. Um, so he was dear friends with them, but he didn't work that closely with them, though. He would occasionally sort of, you know, have fun intellectual conversations about how one could assassinate Stalin. Um, he did, however, work on the CIA payroll a number of, you know, both Kennan and Nitsa, this is something I discovered from their papers, is that when they didn't have a job, they called the CIA and worked for him. Kennan in the 1950s, you know, was consulting to Alan Dulles. He was on the CIA payroll from, gosh, I think it's 54 to 59. Um, Nitsa in the 1970s, under the Carter administration, he's working for the CIA, you know, which I actually didn't even find out until the book was finally published and I got Nitsa's, my FOIA request on Nitsa's CIA file was finally sent to me this August or something. Um, so both were, you know, deeply involved in quiet, secret work. I mean, Kennan helped those disastrous operations in Albania, the ones where uh, they completely, um, you know, sabotaged by, by Kim Philby. Kennan helped plan them. He helped plan where the boats were going to go. He helped plan where the people were going to be dropped. I mean, that, uh, you know, was, was George Kennan. Yes. Right here? You're, oh, you were just scratching your nose. Okay, yeah, right here. <laughs> Hi, uh, Jeremy Pam, uh, USIP. Um, I want to return to the question of grand strategy and something uh, that, Nick, you d said in passing, uh, it, it, when, when Kennan was trying to hire Nitsa for policy planning, uh, Ashton said, dismissed him and said, he's just a Washington operator. Um, I wonder if there is any relation, if you, if you think there's any relationship between grand strategy and success as a Washington operator. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it, it occurs to me that success uh, as a Washington operator produces a certain kind of grand strategy, uh, one that appeals to the strategist class, if you will. Uh, whereas, uh, is it possible that lack of success in Washington, of Kennan's sort, mm -hmm. uh, might produce a different kind of grand strategy that perhaps is, is more comfortable uh, sort of producing discomfort among the strategist class? That's a great question. I mean, I feel like we should redirect this to uh, stare, the, stare the, share the stage with a Washington operator and a grand strategist right here. <laughs> um, but I, I will quickly say um, that 
when you're outside of government, you certainly have much more opportunity to, to produce a clear and consistent grand strategy. When you look back and you say, what was Nitz's strategy, what was Kennan's strategy, you can come up with answers for both, but it's a lot easier to come up with Kennan's. You know, you can talk about realism and political containment. With Nitz, he's constantly shifting his positions on all sorts of things, and that's largely because he's engaged in the day-to-day -day decisions of how things operate. So when you're a Washington operator, when you're on the inside, when you actually have to decide what we're going to do on Tuesday, how that changes on Wednesday, it makes it much harder to um, have a central, clear, grand strategy. But I want to turn this over to the Washington operator. What I would say, and I think this is a key question that I think anyone in this environment uh, who serious struggles with, is that, uh, let me give you an example. Um, I don't care where people's views are on it, but on the question of Obama's decision with regard to Afghanistan. If you go out and you look at the mainline uh, leading uh, national security strategists in the academic community, I would say 80 to 90 percent of them oppose the direction that Barack Obama went. They were out there, they were writing, they were signing letters. Um, they're, they're, now, you can say academia, for a lot of its own reasons, has decided to be very detached from the policy environment, penalizes those folks that try and move up in academia uh, uh, through that realm. But on the whole, if you're, if you're to be honest, the, 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 the lack of sense of consequence that they had about taking a, a critical position that they felt was shaped by their own you know, calculations is there. Now, inside Washington, what's very interesting is there's also a vigorous debate going on. But if you were to look at those people who are sculpting themselves for appointment, uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee hearings, the, the latitude that they've had to play a cr critic role has been has been role. So the, so the machine has ways of, of generating, in my view, conformity. It's not to say that one would be successful or not in terms of presenting a well thought out, comprehensive, alternative course. You know, one of my views, and have been very public, is that the geopolitical cost of Afghanistan being tied up there, not figuring out a way to close that down, is costing us in a lot of other areas. And it's costing us not only with places like Iran, but with allies. If you look at Japan, you look at Israel, you look at Saudi Arabia, you look at Germany, it's harder to find a string of allies that are pushing America back on all fronts. And so this shows that the equilibrium of relationships that we had with allies is broken. And that's, that's very interesting, but you don't hear that much mm -hmm. from people who want to go uh, into the administration as a sort of you know, sense of conformity. So the Washington operator versus the strategist, I think, is being you know, driven by a number of factors, and it's often driven by those people who think they, they can do it. You're sitting next to someone who, I don't know, maybe Mike Lind will be director of policy planning someday. I sincerely doubt it. I'd like uh, to see those confirmation uh, hearings. Uh, you, know, we've, you know, he and I are probably far too toxic uh, for any administration, but there are people here who can operate as Washington operators, but not be in the line to say we're going to go work for the government. And thus, we have a freedom here that differentiates our our capabilities in this marketplace in a way lots of others. I can run circles around some people who want to have a job in the government because they can't do what I can do. But it doesn't necessarily make us smarter. So the, the but the big distinction is, I think, with academia. But I can see Mike wants to jump in here. Well, I, I just want to weigh in on this. Uh, I've seen this term grand strategy, which I don't think your grandfather or Kennan would have used necessarily. Step just a little uh, bit forward because you're in front of the camera, Mike. Yeah, uh, this, this term grand strategy sort of became popular in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, largely in the academy. Uh, and the idea was to have something uh, like the cabinet diplomacy of, of uh, Europe in the 19th century. Uh, and I, I think there is a real tension in a democratic republic as to whether you can have a kind of classic European great power grand strategy, which more or less implies an autocratic system where the great strategist genius, you know, Bismarck or Cavour or whomever, uh, comes up with the plan and then it is simply implemented at all levels of government. I don't think you can do that in modern European democracies. It's not simply an American thing. I don't think you can do it in Japan. I, I think that the moment you have uh, constitutional democracy with multiple centers of power. You can have a strategy, but you can't have uh, uh, that kind of autocratic strategic elite. And so, and that would just uh, be, be uh, the point I'd like to make. Uh, in my book, The American Way of Strategy, I argued that certain kinds of strategy cannot be implemented by the United States, such as a clever balance of power strategy, because it requires uh, a more or less firm autocratic regime where you can carry out 
uh, uh, these very complex uh, policies on, on a long period of time without, you know, individual members of Congress and, you know, exposure by the press and, and all of these other things messing it up. So I, I think that there's an affinity between uh, Kennan's dislike of democracy, which you see from the 1930s all the way up, up to later. And, and I, I think Kennan is a very a bad model in a lot of ways because – uh, he had he convinced generations of young people to think if they go into the academy uh, and are like George Kennan, they can come up with this great Bismarckian grand strategy. And uh, you know, if only democracy doesn't get in the way. And I, I think that's if, kind of a bad legacy. Throw it back to, to you, Mike. Would would in in, in, a, in a more dynamic world that that isn't Bismarckian, where information and whatnot is moving quicker? Can you, more quickly, can you be a strategist in a dynamic sense? I mean, would, would you consider Osama bin Laden a grand strategist of sorts? You know, and I don't mean to be, I mean, precocious, but I do mean it in a way that someone who had a very good sense of how to push the buttons of certain states and move the dynamics. When you go back and you read what uh, Peter Bergen got from Osama bin Laden in his 1997 interviews with him, it's fairly remarkable the prescience and, and, and what bin Laden thought would be necessary to, to puncture a certain mystique cave. So when, when maybe he's just a strategist. No, but, every yeah. country, for that matter, you know, corporations, you know, stateless uh, terrorists, they can have strategies. Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying is the political structure makes a difference. Uh, this country cannot have a strategic elite uh, that comes up with these plans and then implements them mm -hmm. through an autocratic bureaucracy in the sense that Imperial Germany could have done, you know, or, or 18th century Britain. I'll, I'll, just, give you, I'll just give you one example. Uh, I asked Henry Kissinger many years ago what he meant by the balance of power. Did he mean a global balance of power in which other countries balanced against the U.S.? And he explained no. And I think he's explained this elsewhere. Uh, the U.S. would preserve the balance of power in each other region. Right, you know, so we'd have this kind of, uh, it's my word, not his, but sort of divided rule policy towards the Europeans, Balancer. towards the Asians. Yeah, the U.S. would be an ex outside balance for many academics are in favor of this. Uh, Kennan's North American benevolent dictatorship could do that, hmm. right? It would be able it. to play the French yeah. off until the Germans got, and then turn against the, you know, build up the Germans to cut down the French. The United States of America cannot do that. Right, so our choices of strategies are constrained by the kind of constitutional system we have. Uh, I'm just glad that Michael Lynn got out of the way of the camera because we now officially have him on tape agreeing in part with uh, George Kennan, which I believe has never happened before in my many conversations with him. I okay, can see many more days. Oh, to uh, Aberdeen. Did your grandfather talk about Kissinger and Brzezinski because they were the two strategic giants of the last 50 years? <laughs> was he closer to Brzezinski or to Kissinger? <laughs> uh, okay, he hated them both. Um, or he, let's put it this way. He, uh, he hated Kissinger and he disagreed profoundly with Brzezinski. Um, he hated Kissinger? Interesting. In 1954, my grandfather starts a, um, his, chair of a organiz his chair of a policy group at the Council on Foreign Relations about, partly about whether limited nuclear war is possible. He talks about it and there's a young 31-year-old guy taking notes and um, my grandfather brings it up. Later, Kissinger comes to chair of the group, my grandfather sort of steps aside. Kissinger then takes a lot of what the group discussed and turns it into his you know, hugely best-selling book. Um, my grandfather is not pleased that this younger man has suddenly become this incredibly famous you know, uh, nuclear war theorist about these ideas that Nitsa believes he has a patent on. He writes a review, um, which he later describes as saying, every sentence contains either an error or a lie in this book. Um, or plagiarism. So, um, <laughs> vicious. Then in the 1970s, he, you know, works constantly. He's, you know, aligned with Mel Lair to undermine Kissinger at every possible opportunity during the SALT talks, something that Kissinger is not particularly pleased about. And then there's an episode that I get into the book, which is, you know, I, I don't know exactly the truth of what happens, but it has a profound effect on my grandfather, um, which is that he's, one of my grandfather's closest friends is Bud Zumwalt, who is in 1975 running for Senate on essentially a platform of, um, you know, more weapons, less Kissinger. And phone rings at uh, Zumwalt's house in December 75. Voice comes on the line. Admiral Zumwalt, you should know that in three days, Henry Kissinger will call a press conference denouncing you. Three days later, Kissinger calls a surprise press conference, denounces Zumwalt. Interesting. March, phone rings in Zumwalt's house. Um, 
Hello, Admiral Zumwalt. You should know that on several occasions, uh, Dr. Kissinger has said to Dobrynin that an accident should happen to Zumwalt. <laughs> Hangs up the phone. So, what on earth does that mean? Zumwalt writes a memo of it and gives it to my grandfather. I find this in his papers. So essentially, Zumwalt, and I you know, confirmed the phone call happened from Zumwalt's children who were there at the time. I tried desperately to figure out who made that phone call. Was it someone on Kissinger's staff warning of an actual conversation where Kissinger said something maybe a little off the mark? I tried to talk to Dobrynin, but I, you know, I, I got Besmertnik, who said it's you know, probably not correct. Lots of people on Kissinger's staff I talked to, some of whom said, you know, probably happened. Some of whom said this is ridiculous. I never get to the truth of it. But the point is, is that my grandfather at this point not only starts to think of Kissinger as someone who doesn't understand the strategic balance of power and who is giving away the store during the SALT negotiations, but someone who may or may not have a plan to do evil to my closest friend. Um, and so they, they're actually, it's very combative. They later reconcile. I interviewed Kissinger and they talk, you know, he talked about how close he was and how friendly he was my grandfather from the late 70s onward. And that's absolutely true. And they're you know, charming old men. And you know, Kissinger gave lovely toasts in the late years of my grandfather's life. But there was a vicious battle between the two of them. Um, for a considerable period of time. Brzezinski, I mean, a lot of this is just wrapped up in, you know, they were close later on, Brzezinski teaches at Sice, my grandfather thought highly of him. But during the Carter administration, you know, my grandfather disagreed with Brzezinski on basically everything. And my grandfather's job was to undermine Brzezinski. Um, you know, my grandfather spent most of the Carter years uh, trying to derail the SALT II Treaty and trying to derail Carter in large part because of out of peak for not having been hired. I mean, Carter famously, in the summer of 76, brings in eight Democratic foreign policy establishment types, and they meet at planes, and they sit in a circle. And what, is, what is right about my foreign policy? What is wrong? And you know, everybody else is sort of you know, subservient and right. You know, Mr. Carter, you're right about all this and wrong about this. My grandfather says, you're wrong about everything. Um, seven of those eight people are given top jobs. Uh, <laughs> one of them is not. My grandfather then you know, does all sorts of things to hurt Carter. Carter, my editor is Carter's editor. He read the book. He uh, came back the next day, read the section on Salt too. He said, Paul Nitsa, always was a horse's ass. Um, so there was, there was a lot of tension between uh, Brzezinski and my grandfather, though later on they, you know, quite, quite friendly and set of agreements. But I think with both men, the day-to-day -day battles in Washington led to a lot of heat. I mean, I think this really raises, before we go to Gary, and for the last question, it really raises the uh, uh, issue that I raised at the beginning that – we, as a public, have no idea the degree to which personal peak and rivalry, emotion, ego have driven. Maybe, maybe that's part of a, uh, an intellectual uh, understanding, but you know, when, I would, when I would tell people after having worked in the Senate and looked on national security issues or weapons uh, development decisions and, and you look at the whole human dimension of it, you, it, it almost feels like a crime because you're making very key national security decisions about the security of a nation that have to do with the uh, paranoia or, or the egos of people. It's, it's very interesting. But Gary, final? Nick, hi. Uh, Gary Mitchell from the Mitchell Report. And I want to just say that um, I have read the book, and it is brilliant. Well, thank you. Uh, and uh, I, I really appreciate it. And if you haven't read it, you should. Um, <laughs> All you people watching on video hear that. <laughs> yeah, it's that good. Um, uh, that I also wanted to say that when I read the book, I was I came away thinking not hawk dove, and yeah. I know that wasn't really necessarily what you were getting at was that these were two people who who had fundamentally different perspectives about how to keep America from getting into conflicts that it shouldn't get into. Yeah. Um, uh, that that was a that was a takeaway for me. Now having having said that. Uh, it seems the, the question that, that I, I have is, is this conversation that, that, that Steve and Michael Lind have had about grand strategy and whether there's, you know, there's, that, that's possible in, in, mm -hmm. in, this, uh, in the country today, and I would agree that it isn't. That, that one could argue, and I know Gary Hart, who's written about this a lot, um, says that, you know, this, that, that the, the, the period that launched Ken and, and Nitsa and carried them for the most part was really about communism when things were uh, uh, more easily reduced to black, white, good, bad, etc. We now live at a time when there's sort of more entry points mm -hmm. into thinking about grand strategy like yeah. climate change, etc. Do you think that if uh, the ultimate hypothetical question, uh, if, if uh, Kennan and Nitsa were in their 30s today, mm -hmm. 
um, what would they be thinking about? Whoa. Um, well, Kenneth would be writing, would be either in the Foreign Service or recently resigned, um, writing beautiful but cranky essays about um, Obama's senseless decision to escalate the war in Afghanistan, which had been you know, a consistent failure because of America's overextended ambitions. Um, he would also be writing essays, presumably, uh, actually probably be praising Obama's uh, Russian policy and I think calling for a, a version of containment for, for Iran. Um, my grandfather, if he were in government today, would have decided shortly after September 11th that the thing that mattered was terrorism, would have, uh, you know, learned Arabic, tried to study, you know, the intricacies of every um, possible terrorist group and would have a highly evolved uh, theory about what exactly we should do and how we should project force to counter them. And so he would be working at the State Department or would recently have been fired for trying to sort of push himself ahead and undermine somebody else. Uh, I can't tell you exactly what he would be arguing, but I can tell you that he would be trying to be the world's greatest expert on this topic. I think with that, that's a great ending. It's very interesting. Nick Compton, thank you so much. Uh, Thanks, Steve. Congratulations on the book, and thank, thank you all you. for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you.